Hello. Um, so on behalf of the Biochemical Society and Portland Press, I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, which is part of the Biochemistry Focus webinar series. Topics in the series include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text, and we really welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in our webinar series. So if it's a good idea, do let us know. Please see the website for more details. Um, to start with, I'll introduce myself. I'm Lisa Chakrabarty. I'm Professor of Mitochondrial Biology at the University of Nottingham. This is a very special webinar. We're celebrating the 60th anniversary of the Colworth Medal, kindly sponsored by Unilever. The Colworth Medal is a prestigious annual award presented for outstanding research by an early career biochemist of any nationality who has carried out the major majority of their work in the UK or the Republic of Ireland. In this series, we'll be bringing together some of our past winners from across the decades to discuss their careers, achievements, and to give us some advice. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Steve Jackson, Professor Andrew Sharrox, Professor Giles Hardingham, and Professor Robin May. Before I start with the introductions, I'd like to remind everyone that questions are encouraged throughout the webinar, and uh, we'll save these up and we'll ask them at the end of the discussions. So please type your questions into the box as shown in the image on the screen, and we'll try to answer as many as time allows. So just to start with, I'm going to do a couple of lines of introduction that isn't going to do anywhere near justice to um, our panelists today, but just so that um, we can um, see who's who on um, this webinar today. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Steve Jackson, who's the Frederick James Quick Professor of Biology at the University of Cambridge and Head of Cancer Research UK Laboratories at the Wellcome Trust, um, CRUK. Steve's pioneering research has identified many DNA damage response proteins, established how they function, and how they are, in many cases, strongly evolutionary conserved, and helped define how their dysfunction yields cancer and other diseases. Um, on to Andrew Sharrox, who is the Associate Dean for Research Technology at the University of Manchester. Andrew's research interests include signal-mediated gene regulation and eukaryotic transcriptional control in relation to esophageal cancer and stem cell differentiation. Our next panellist is Giles Hardingham, who is the City of Edinburgh Professor of Pharmacology at the University of Edinburgh and Centre Director of the UK DRI. Giles's research helped to shed light on the basic mechanisms by which calcium signalling through the NMDA receptor can control the survival and death of neurons. And then we have Robin May, who is Professor of Infectious Diseases and Director of the Institute of Microbiology and Infection at the University of Birmingham. Robin's research focuses on host pathogen interactions particularly in understanding how some pathogens are able to subvert the innate immune system. His work is aimed at improving the treatment or prevention of opportunistic infections in patients with impaired immunity. So thank you to all our panelists for um, agreeing to be on this webinar and uh, for um, getting through all the tech hurdles to be here. Um, at this time. So the way we're going to do this is I'm going to ask you um, some questions, uh, hopefully to stimulate some discussion. And um, the first of these questions is, um, if you could please tell us a little bit about your career pathway. And I'll, I'm going to pick on you as you appear on my screen, uh, possibly to start off with. Um, so tell us a little bit about your career pathway, the major elements, and how this these elements have led to where you find yourself now. So I'm going to start with um, the first uh, person on the screen, which is, uh, who is uh, Robin May. Welcome, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I'm happy you can hear me now. We had a few tech problems earlier, but uh, everyone's smiling good. Um, well, I need to start with an apology, actually, because I think, um, so, so your, your kind biography is, is definitely out of date. So, so I'm no longer the uh, director of the IMI at Birmingham, that's Willem van Sheik. Um, uh, because I'm actually on secondment at the moment uh, uh, to government and have been for the last two or three years. Um, so uh, my career path to date, well, I 
started off. So the one thing I'm definitely not, I'm apologies in advance, is I'm definitely not a biochemist. I did check when they awarded me the medal, I was still allowed it, but um, but apparently that's true. So I'm originally a plant scientist, did plant science at Oxford. I went on to do um, uh, sort of cell biology PhD, first at UCL and then at uh, Birmingham. Um, and then 2005 joined Birmingham to start my own group on uh, host pathogen interactions where I've been ever since um, and indeed I was for a time the director of our Institute of Microbiology and Infection uh, but right back in 2020 um, I joined uh, the Food Standards Agency which is a government department um, uh, as their chief scientific advisor and I've been doing that job part-time ever since um, so I'm 60% with them 40% uh, uh, Birmingham I used to have a lab I should hasten to add and do do the research you, you mentioned um, and I've also recently taken up a post as Gresham Professor of Physics, which is a public communication, science communication role down in London. Um, so I sort of try and juggle my time between those three, usually very badly, but um, uh, I, I, you know, hopefully it kind of gets to the end of the week and I've more or less done what I'm supposed to do for three different jobs. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, so Giles, would you like to give us, I'm, I did see Robin that you were you had this new role actually, um, and I wasn't sure how that fitted in. So thanks so much for clarifying that. Um, Giles, would you like to um, tell us a little bit about your career pathway as well? Yeah, sure. I was actually trying to rack my brains when I how I re recognised Robin, and I realised he was he won the Coworth Medal on the fiftieth anniversary. Um, celebrations and so that's probably the last time i saw him we were all in the all in a room at uh, uh, uh portland house uh, so as, as for me well I, I i i my undergraduate degree was in natural sciences um i started i guess i embarked as a student wanting to be a physicist and then deciding it was rather too difficult um uh, and, and and drifted towards uh, 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 molecular biology. Um, so I ended up specialising in biochemistry, and uh, um, and then went on to do a PhD at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology. Um, I actually applied to do a PhD in in Steve's lab, but uh, he, he he wisely uh, chose someone else uh, for the vacancy. <laughs> so, I'm making mistakes, Giles. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, and uh, so that was with uh, uh, um, uh, Hilmar Barding, a, a young PI just just setting up his lab, um, uh, having relocated from uh, uh, from from the east coast. So yeah, I was working on calcium signaling um, as a PhD student and as a as a uh, a an MRC postdoctoral fellow also at the LMB. So in Cam I was in Cambridge all told for about 11 years and then moved up to Edinburgh um, 21 years ago, um, just to set, set up, well, to try and set up my lab. It took a couple of years. Um, and uh, yeah, I was kind of a, 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 a jobbing group leader um, working primarily on on uh, how neurons and glial cells work together in concert in health to, to, to resolve homeostatic challenges and to make sure, you know, these post-mitotic neuronal circuits, how they survive for, for many decades in a human being. And, and then latterly more how these interactions go wrong in, in neurodegenerative disease. And um, back in 2016, uh, the, the Cameron administration established the UK Dementia Research Institute, which is a, a, a £250 million initiative that has seven centres dotted around the UK. Um, and uh, I'm in charge of the, the Edinburgh one. Um, I'm actually interim director of the of, of the whole UK DRI at the moment, secondary 40% to UCL, but that's just a, a temporary move um, uh, while they recruit a replacement UK director. Uh, uh, I didn't fancy relocating to London, so I didn't apply for the job, but uh, they let me they let me be the, the interim director remotely, which I'm very grateful for. So yeah, so that's me. Thank you so much, Giles. Um, so, should we move on to Andrew, Andrew Sharrocks? Would you like to give us some highlights of your career pathway? 
I'm uh, not sure about highlights, I can give you the pathway. Um, <laughs> so I started off being trained, I was trained as a biochemist in my first degree. Um, I went on to do a PhD when I saw the light of biochemistry. So I was trained in Sheffield. Sheffield's a really hardcore biochemistry place. So you got really subjected to a lot of hardcore biochemistry. So I saw the light, switched to molecular biology, still using my biochemistry skills. So I did a PhD in restriction modification systems. Uh, went on then to do a postdoc again in Sheffield on uh, prokaryotic transcription factors, which then led me on to looking for things in eukaryotes or moving into uh, higher organisms. So I went to Freiburg in Germany then to work in Peter Shaw's lab. Um, so working on um, map kinase responsive transcription factors. I was there for a couple of years, came back to UK set up my own group in Newcastle. We continued along that theme and, and then relocated to Manchester after seven years. I think it's around that time I got a call with Medal. Um, so then, since then, I've been in Manchester ever since. So progressing through the ranks of various, doing various jobs as you do in a university system, um, and now specialise really in oesophageal cancer and uh, transcription regulation in that. So we can expand on that later on if you want. But my career has gone all the way from looking at restriction modification systems in bacteria and biochemically all the way through now to basically dealing with patient samples. So that's me. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, that's Peter Shaw who's in Nottingham now. Is that right? That you work uh, with? Indeed it is Peter Shaw in Nottingham, yeah. Thanks. Um, so, um, Steve, how uh, yes. your career highlights? Or yeah, how? thanks, Lisa. I mean, I guess where does one's career start? Um, I mean, for me, it's interesting. Well, it's, it's, for me, it's interesting that you're celebrating the 60 years of Colworth Medal, starting with Kornberg. I mean, that was a great start. Um, but it's also my 60. Well, my 61st year. I'm, I'm 60, so uh, there's an interesting resonance there. I grew up in Nottingham, where, where, where you are. Um, I'm still a Nottingham Forest fan to this day, and we, we stayed yeah. up this year, which is great. <laughs> um, so I, I grew up in Nottingham, a comprehensive school, high payment, sixth form college, went to Leeds to study biochemistry. I was always interested as kids, you know, in chemistry, growing plants, collecting bugs. And so that was a natural progression for me. Um, then moved to Imperial College to start my PhD. Uh, the group relocated to Edinburgh halfway through. Um, so we have something in common there, Giles, where I finished my PhD, spent, uh, and that was yeast molecular genetics, um, which, uh, which, which really gave me a very strong grounding in actually biochemistry, but also, you know, uh, precision biology, doing things with genetic knockouts and whatever. I then spent four years at UC Berkeley um, with Bob Tejan, where I moved into mammalian transcription, biochemistry, and then came back to the UK in 1991 to a place that's now the, the Gurdon Institute and I was there for 30 years until last year uh, when I've moved which is over half my life and then I've moved my lab very recently to the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Institute on the biomedical campus um, and in a nutshell um, you know I'm professor of biology at the university a post I've had since 1995 um, my lab studies DNA repair we we stumbled into this arena from initial studies on transcription. That's why I got to know Andy a number of years ago. And uh, it's a fascinating subject and we've connected that to biology, but it's also led us into translational activities. So I've, uh, I've founded uh, three biotech companies, uh, the first of which has generated a worldwide blockbuster drug. So um, that's my career and I'm still balancing or trying to balance um, my academic role, which is my actually my major role, with my biotech and, and other activities. Right, thank you so much, Steve. So, I mean, a huge variety of paths there, I think, is uh, what we're seeing. And I think that's the nature of the game, isn't it? Everyone finds their own um, way through this um, forest of um, academia and uh, biochemical research. So, uh, something you mentioned, Robin, it's biosciences that the Biochemical Society um, represents now. So any, anybody who's doing anything in the bioscience arena is uh, very much part of what we're interested in. Um, so next on to the quick fire round. Um, no, not actually. Um, 
what I'd like to um, ask you is um, if you can remember how you first became interested, I think Steve's touched on this a little bit, how you first became interested in pursuing a career uh, within the molecular biosciences. Um, and so, you know, examples, was there a specific teacher, mentor, experience or topic or anything at all? Now, I, was, I thought I'd just go around to each of you and ask you to, to tell me very briefly, you know, a couple of words. And then if you, if you have others that you'd like to let me know about or let all of us know about, then uh, we can go from there. So um, I was going to start with um, Andrew this time. Um, <laughs> Lucky you dip. Like tell us if there's, um, you know, if there's a memory of a distinct moment that you thought this is something that's really exciting. There, there definitely is because uh, I did mention before I was in Sheffield, this hotbed of biochemistry, and honestly, I felt it felt it was deadly dull, and I was going to quit science and go into industry at that point. Um, so any biochemistry, or true biochemist on the call, don't get disheartened because I think it's really important and needs doing. But uh, the teaching wasn't of the uh, most inspiring nature at that time. Um, and then they recruited at that time some of the first uh, molecular biologists. So there was um, a few there and Dave Hornby was one of those who'd just come back from Switzerland. He'd been working in um, his Werner Arbor's lab and worked on restriction modification systems. And to me, that just sounded cool. It was different, and um, I could see how that worked. So that's that's what inspired me really. To, so it got, it got a difference from what I was doing, and I could see where that was going. So it's new, exciting, something to get into and move forward from there. Oh, that's lovely. That's really nice. Um, Giles. Um, I guess what what uh, other than uh, my rather flippant um, uh, comment that I found physics too difficult when I, I, I started doing it in, in uh, 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 at university. Um, I, I guess I get I got really interested in in, in molecular cellular biology um, thanks to my tutor. So one of the one of the things that one gets at, at, at some universities that are richer than others. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, um, is, is you get one-to-one -one supervision in in Cambridge, um, and it's really a um, a great uh, uh, um, uh, you know privilege to to, to talk on a you know, one-to-one or two-to-one basis with, with with academics. And and the person that got me interested in cell biology was my cell biology tutor, John Walker. So John at the time was um, well, and a, 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 a a group leader at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, um, and he 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 used to tell us a lot of tales about the olden days at, at, at the LMB. He was a, I think he was a PhD student or a postdoc. Certainly, I think I'm pretty sure it was a PhD student in Fred Sanger's lab, um, and he would tell us about um, the. He, their efforts to sequence the mitochondrial genome, and and he was he was very proud that he once held the record for the longest piece of DNA sequenced, um, uh, which uh, I thought was quite cool at the time. And 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 uh, but it was generally just in talking about um, I guess the human human stories behind the discoveries, which I found really interesting. Um, and it seemed like a, an area where there was still a lot of things to, to find out. So I guess it was it was probably John that turned my my interest towards uh, to, towards bioscience. Wow, thank you. Um, still lots to find out, I think. So that's that's nice. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Do you have a particular moment or person or? There's lots of them on the way, please. So, I mean, my chemistry teacher suggested that I study biochemistry, so I did. Um, my my biology teacher was inspirational, Doc, Doc, Doc Bird, Dr. Bird, um, but he didn't stay on the subject matter of the syllabus. So we realised as we got to the exam that about half of what we'd been taught wasn't actually on the syllabus. He was just very excited about fungi, but um, he. Uh, but he, he did he did have this passion for science, and I think I saw that. 
And then in Leeds, it was people like Steve Higgins and Charlie McDonald when we were doing the first DNA sequencing. I, I know Charlie had just come up from Leicester where uh, Bill Brammer or, or, or whatever was, was, was doing sequencing and they brought the technology up. And me with my young hands was about the only person who could get it to work. And it was a bit more difficult in those days, the sequencing. So, so that got me into molecular biology combining it with biochemistry and then lots of people you know Gene Beggs my PhD supervisor Peter Rigby in London Bob Tejan was an inspiration in Berkeley and then I guess in Cambridge it's just two people it's, it's Ron Lasky who, um, who who recruited me uh, to the what, what's now the Gurdon Institute and an inspiration is John Gurdon who's only recently retired he's, he's nearly 30 years older than me so he's he's I used to go in at the weekend uh, much more than I do now and in my early years as a group leader and John's car was always there before I got there in the morning and it was invariably still there when I was leaving in the evening so uh, he was a bit of an inspiration in that in that regard. <laughs> Great stories, thank you. Uh, Robin? I, I was going to say I'm going to cheat and have multiple ones but since Steve has already done that I feel like I'm, I can do the same thing now. Um, <laughs> So, so my, so I can, I can clearly place, and uh, the reason I'm interested in biology uh, dates from when I was about five, <laughs> um, and I suspect like lots of people on the call, uh, is a direct result of David Attenborough, because I, I remember watching very clearly um, Life on Earth, and uh, you know, when he's journeying down the Grand Canyon and looking at fossils, and I was like, whoa, this is very, very cool. Um, I, mean, I, w I was at school, I remember being at school, but only just, I was pretty young, um, and, uh, and that sort of set me on the, on the path. Uh, but that, I was there for many, many years, I was going to do big animal biology. In fact, right up until I chose my UCAS form, I was going to be a vet. Um, and then like a couple of weeks before putting in my UCAS form, I was like, I don't actually want to be a vet anymore. Um, and so who sort of my default? So I went to Oxford uh, to do biology, uh, largely because the course was completely broad and you could do anything. And so I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, that felt like a good thing to do. Um, and when I was there, there were two people in particular who were really, really uh, formative. Um, one is Sarah Gerr, who's down next to now, who's a plant pathologist. Um, and Sarah, I remember uh, teaching this amazing course, um, uh, which was basically about pathogens generally, but it made no distinction between animals and plants. And, and that was something that really stuck with me, this idea that it's not about the organism, it's about the kind of molecular interaction that drives a disease. And, and there are lots of fundamentals. Um, and, and she had, it was a, a very inspiring person, also very, very approachable, very energizing. Um, my project, my lab projects there with David Shotton, um, who is a cell biologist. Um, and uh, for, the, for the younger people on the call, you'll be amused and bemused to know that I did my undergraduate project recording cell biological movies on Betamax videotape, um, which, uh, which which has not existed for many years. Um, but that got me completely into this idea of you know cells move and cells do stuff you can see, uh, and you can get kind of quantitative data out of that. Um, so that was that was really uh, formative. Uh, and then last but definitely not least, uh, my PhD supervisor, uh, Laura Macheski, who's recently moved down to Cambridge from the Beats, actually, um, who uh, I joined as her first PhD student and uh, has, has been throughout my entire PhD, and I have to say for the 20 years there and thereafter, an absolute, absolute inspiration, uh, largely because she gave me completely free range, she threw ideas at me, said, go follow your nose. She was fantastic fun to work with um, and a real inspiration. And um, uh, it through both the really good moments and the less good moments of a, of a PhD that everyone has. So, so yeah, those four are my top four. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to move on to um, our next question, which is um, actually maybe um, folds in with what you already told us a little bit about, but um, for the people who are listening in today, um, can you give us some ideas about what and or maybe who um, do you feel helps to support you to achieve um, and be successful? Um, and again, this could be mentors, collab but you know, what should we all be looking for around us to help us to get to where we would really like to be? Um, and I'm just gonna throw this open. Andrew? Um, I think the most important thing are your mentors, so the people who are leading the research. So I'm lucky that I had three people. When I turned up in the lab PhD and the two postdocs, they just said, what do you want to do? Here's the general area, get on with it and just let me to it. Um, that approach doesn't seem to work too well with most people these days, but uh, for me, it was, it was really instrumental. And the other side of that is the people that work for you. Getting really talented people working for you is the thing that drives your success. And I'm really lucky to have had a, 
a Chinese sort of Taiwanese, you'll shoot me for calling him Chinese, a Taiwanese postdoc with me for many years now, and he's been fantastic. We've managed to work as a team through the years and generate success. Great. I can see that Steve's got um, somebody that he wants to ask about. Just quickly, uh, following up on Andy, Andy, I agree. In the end, it's down to people, and I have this mindset that I can have some great ideas, uh, but if you don't have good people in working with you in the lab, they'll go nowhere. And I might have some stupid ideas. Um, and uh, if I share those with good people, they'll find something better to do. So in the end, the, the, the PI is there for, for reasons and maybe sets the, the tone of the lab and the direction. But in the end, it's all about being an environment, an ecosystem, really. I think that's that's what it is. It's, it's the whole chain and network. Um, and uh, people who tend to do well tend to uh, use and be used by the network. It's a two way thing. Absolutely. Um, Robin? Yeah, I was going to jump in, maybe slightly tangential to your question, Lisa, but I think one thing that I would say is that, you know, you also, you, you make your own network a lot, and, and I'm, a, you know, one of the things that worries me a little bit uh, these days is the kind of level of competition in science is so much so that I very often hear people saying, oh, well, I'm going to a meeting, but I'm not going to talk about that because it's too new, or I'm not, you know, and I've always had the approach um, that you should talk about everything all the time, um, uh, uh, and I just think that is a way to, you know, uh, yeah, there's a risk, you might get scooped, you might get, but that is the way you make those friends and those mentors. If you go out and say, I've done this, I've seen that bit of data, I don't know what to make of it, what do you think? If you're lucky, someone will come up and give you some advice. Um, and occasionally you might get, you know, stabbed in the back. But um, but uh, to me, the gains have always far outweighed the the, the losses. Um, so I guess it's an encouragement for people to if you're if you're thinking twice about whether or not to share stuff, I would share it. Um, you know, you will you will regret far more not sharing something and realizing that someone could have helped than if you share it and occasionally realize that someone has done something that you didn't want them to do with it. Um, I think we've lost Steve temporarily here, but uh, Robin, I wanted to comment on that. Oh, he's back. Uh, Robin, I wanted to comment on that. Is that something that you um, that you feel now, or is that something that you've always um, done through your career? Well, I, I was really encouraged actually by Laura um, as my PhD supervisor to do that. And actually, I should say, so I did my postdoc with Ronald Plastic on uh, something completely different on RNA interference in, in C. elegans. Um, and, and both of those people were, were always very much of the view that you should share. And I have to say, doing my postdoc in C. elegans in C. elegans, I don't know if people are working on C. elegans in, are listening in, but it, it was then, and I suspect still now, it was an incredibly open field. And if you went to a meeting and talked about published stuff, people would tell you off. Um, and that, I think, is really, really helpful. Um, and so, yeah, certainly that's something I've kind of always, always felt. And I have to say, you know, people reciprocate. Really, I remember very early on, being a very new PI going to the meeting, and one of the biggest sort of characters in, in my my field was at the meeting. Um, and I remember sharing some very early data. Thinking, this, you know, this could go badly wrong. He could turn around and actually he turned around and said, "Do you know we've seen the same thing? Shall we do some stuff together and maybe publish together?" Um, and, and you know, and he could easily turn around and say, "I'm going to blow you out the water tomorrow, finish your career," and certainly didn't. So I think people, you know, people respond well to that. Good. That's nice. Nice bit of advice. Um, any other, Giles? Yeah, I mean, I could take. I think we're all, we're all, I'm sure, um, have benefited enormously from uh, both formal and informal support networks. And what I would say to 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 any youngsters is is that if they they have you know, researchers whose work they they admire or interested in uh, or interested in collaborating, then just just reach out because some of the best opportunities that have come my way have just been from uh uh contacting um uh people even like when we used to pick up a phone and and people would answer the phone and stuff like that um people and i would have thought would not give me the time of day of almost invariably being super supportive of of of, of me and my younger career what the person that springs to mind uh immediately is mike um Barrage was at the Abraham while I was doing a um, uh, doing a PhD, and he was he was immensely supportive, not only in, in, in advising on 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 the research direction I was taking, both as a postdoc and a, and a new PI, but also just simple things like writing references and being a general um, uh, sponsor in its broadest. Uh, sense of the word, and and I still I still rely on um, on the wisdom and expertise of my my elders and betters uh, to 
two people that uh, have been a, a great support, intellectual, moral, everything um, to to my my career in Edinburgh. One's been uh, one is Adrian Bird, um, who, who Steve will obviously know very well. Um, Adrian uh, is again. I feel I mean I mean you know I'm pushing fifty, but and and but Adrian's for far more active and in 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 pretty much every respect uh, despite having about 20 years um on me and adrian for those people who don't know um has discovered uh, uh, dna methylation um uh, and and um has worked a lot on mecp2 the, the methyl cytosine binding protein he always um uh uh there to give me advice and tell me particularly when ideas are rubbish um and another person who is amazing who i'm in awe of and and has a uh, 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 time for 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 me and many other more junior researchers is dario alessi in uh in dundee um uh, D dario of course is the director of the um of the mrc protein phosphorylation unit which has had its fair share of Colworth medal winners over the years, uh, Dario, uh, Dario himself, but he would always instill on in me the, the, the belief um, that really you're only, firstly, you're only as good as your next paper, not your last one, um, and B, um, what you need to it doesn't matter where you publish it, it, it matters what you publish and you need to make an impact at the point of publication because unless you, if you don't make an impact then you're never going to make an, an impact. So he was very much a, a pure scientist and a, and a, and a pure biochemist um, and uh, by him and Adrian by being at the, you know, just the cutting edge of these things but yet still having time to support young PIs give them advice and and basically devote time to people where you wonder where they where, where they get the time because they're so busy so yeah. i think having one's own network of 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 um of 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 of, of mentors is, is is has been invaluable to me brilliant thank you so i think overall it's the people around you the people who have uh, watched over you and the people who you're you're working with I guess but so and this is all great and there I think I mean I think we have a lot of that kind of support available if we know where to look and um, we can be very lucky um, just there. Back to Giles, I think as asking for it um, and not just waiting for it is, yeah. is, is an important characteristic that's yeah that is really important isn't it because you can't uh, wait for it to just land on your doorstep but um, we're painting a very very rosy picture um there must have been obstacles along the way as well though um so um could each of you tell me about you know uh, or tell us about um an obstacle that seemed insurmountable perhaps but um ways in which you overcame them or in hindsight how you could have overcome them differently perhaps or you know some obstacle that was just you know in your career. Um, do I have any volunteers to go first? Steve, thank you. Yeah, well, I think if, if anybody gets into a research career and, 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 and they're all highlights and no lowlights, then uh, that's not really training you for what cutting edge science is all, all about. And if we're all doing cutting edge science, uh, we should expect some failures uh, because, you know, you, you should be working at a stage where, where nothing's assured. Um, going back to my PhD, however, um, looking back at it, um, I, you know, I used to do 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week in those days. And my first year was very productive um, in terms of generating stuff, but it wasn't very effective. Um, and so one issue that really was an issue in my PhD is that basically after nine months into my PhD working like a dog, I realized that the yeast strain that I'd been handed and my whole career, my whole project was based on this. I realized it wasn't what it was supposed to be. And I spent the next five months sorting out the yeast genetic backgrounds of all the strains in the lab. So when I was in month 13 or 14, basically I started my PhD project and it was only a three year PhD. So that was devastating, realizing that a whole year had gone to naught, although I'd learned lots of techniques. 
uh, but I managed to pick myself up and that, that was supported by colleagues, friends and, and my PhD supervisor. But uh, yeah, I, I could have, it's the only time in my career when I've, I've, I've you know, considered the idea of, of quitting and, and going into another arena. But I'm gl glad I, uh, I got back on the bike and my PhD was okay in the end. And so are we. <laughs> Uh, Robin, are you volunteering to go next? I'm going to pick up on Steve's theme of uh, thinking about quitting um, uh, because I suspect, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm putting words to this moment, I suspect all of us at some point have thought, is this really what I'm going to do with the rest of my life? Um, and I think we don't talk about that enough actually. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons, yeah, and also it's, it's very dangerous to do that in a way that is somehow everything else is inferior because of course there are millions of other brilliant careers out there and I think um, that's really important but I was going to say I mean what I was going to share was in my postdoc actually um, so I done my you know PhD with Laura and I had a fantastic time I, I moved to Royal Pasteur's lab in the Netherlands for my postdoc and it was everything possible could be different I was working on a model organism I was doing genetics not cell biology that I had my background in uh, Laura's lab my left was relatively small Ronald's was enormous 35 people I think um, uh, the whole scale was different um, and nothing worked for 18 months, nothing worked at all. Um, and other people, more importantly, everyone else in the lab was doing brilliant stuff and getting nature papers and I was clearly not. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it was very interesting because I, you, know, you asked what I would do differently. And I, I look back now and I felt, if I'm honest, I felt relatively unsupported and that's in no way a negative reflection or not, but I just felt like I was sort of drifting in this sea of stuff. And I look back at my younger self now and think, why didn't I just go and knock on his door and say, for God's sake, I need some help with this. <laughs> um, but I didn't. And, and, and he didn't come to find me. Uh, you know, and so, so I ended up in that, that situation that you know, Steve just mentioned, I make sure you ask for it. That is really true. If you don't ask me, I will help you out. Um, and I remember at my lowest moment, I tell this story a lot now that I'm working uh, for government, uh, I thought at the time, right, it's time for something different. What I'll do is I'll join the civil service. And in those days, you could do an online quiz about how suitable you were for the civil service. So I spent uh, an evening in the lab, I, I, I embarrassed to say, on their computer doing this thing. It took ages, filled it in, and you press click and submit, and it comes back, spits out at you, and it spat out at me, you are deeply unsuited for a career in civil service. Um, uh, which, given that I now have a career in civil service, um, I should probably keep <laughs> under that. Uh, but it was it was a really good moment, actually, because it really made me think, oh, crikey, if I can't do that, I better go back and make this blinking PCR work instead. Um, and, uh, and it did, and then in the end, it all kind of worked out. But I guess, I mean, the, the two slightly more serious messages there are, you probably shouldn't necessarily trust what online quizzes say about you. Um, and also, it's okay to think like that. And, you know, and it's okay if you decide actually something else is for you and it's also okay if you think no it isn't and I'm going to go back and make this work I think all options are open it's thinking about it and doing something about it that's important rather than just sitting in this kind of state of paralysis great thank you uh, Giles I guess yeah my I guess my low point or one of my low points was um trying to set up my own lab um when I moved up to, to Edinburgh so I, I arrived I had six months temporary money from a a German charity, um, and then I, I failed to get an MRC CDA, and then I failed to get a, a Wellcome Trust um, a CDA, and I was in uh, an old rundown building uh, called the Dick Vet School, which is still an old rundown building, but the university uh, aren't in it anymore. Um, and I've I kind of thought, well, uh, am I just going to be left high and dry? And in, and and I'd come. It was a huge culture shock. I'd come from the LMB, where where ampicillin plates appear by magic in a cupboard, and you know your medium is just there, and you pluck it, and 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 the money is no object to 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 to, to this place where you had to even pre-order dry ice rather you know it didn't exist in a normal you know I, it just didn't compute i didn't know how lucky i was being a junior researcher at lmb but anyway it took and ended up taking me two and a half years before from arriving to edinburgh to recruiting my first person um and uh unfortunately in the meantime i'd got it got a fellowship from the the royal society that funded my salary but it's it two and a half years and now doesn't sound like a long time but back then it seemed like an absolute lifetime and i and i really didn't think i was going to to to, to make it as a as a as a pi so i guess that was the that was sort of a, a not a, a it was a low point but it did last quite a long time almost almost three years 
yeah and so i think it's really important to reflect on these as well because i don't think anybody has a smooth entirely i mean smooth I, probably, ride. I mean um, I, I would want to, i would just lisa just before i did one thing i did want to say is that um the you know looking around the panel um with the exception of yourself lisa are all white males um and so we haven't i guess we haven't faced the types of challenges um, that are associated with gender, ethnicity, um, bias, both conscious and, and subconscious. But, um, so I, I, I feel that, that it's important to, to acknowledge uh, that fact, particularly given the makeup the of the, time, the though, attendees. But at the same time, I think not all white middle-aged males are the same thing you know um you know my, my desk at home was for many years a piece of wood that i bought from a local carpenter in an unheated bedroom with an outside loo so we, we're all different i think that's the thing it's we're all different but um i, I guess yes i guess we're most yes i mean we're i guess we're, you said you're you're state school educated so am i and i'm, I'm proud of it but uh, yeah equality of um equality of opportunity is 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 super important thank you so much giles for bringing that up that's such an that's such an important point um and you know that societies as a whole is trying really hard to address all of those um areas as much as possible and you know steve has got a really good point too sometimes you know the inequalities are hidden as well so you know we really have to be very careful about um how we talk about um, all of this, but thank you so much, Giles, for bringing that up. It's absolutely vital. Um, I, Andrew, we still haven't heard um, from you about um, these terrible obstacles that happen. I was going to say there's not many obstacles that I've come across, but uh, I was going to have the northerners with a chip on his shoulder bit about things. Uh, I've decided not to go down that route. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, the main obstacles, as I see it, and, and Steve. Uh, touched on it a little bit is the failures you have to deal with failures and failures come more often than than successes so in terms of grant applications i would say the biggest challenge is in getting papers published and getting grant applications so you have to be able to have thick skin reset go again and you have to have faith in your own ability in the end and in the terms of papers i mean it's just a case of avoiding professional editor-led journals now, I've stopped sending stuff to them. So if you go to an academic-led journal like NAR, go plug in from an editor, editor for NAR, you will get a fair review from academics rather than being judged before it goes to an academic to judge. But that's my <laughs> biggest obstacle at the moment is those two things. And of course, we have to think about the Portland Press journals as well, associated with the biochemicals. Yeah, Academic-led. So. There, there are some really good journals out there still, and I think, you know, those are the ones we should support. Um, so just quickly, because we are obviously going to run out of time because we've got so many, we've got so many interesting things and lovely, interesting people to talk to. Just, I've got two more questions. I'm going to roll them together a little bit and ask you each to give me a, a line or two about that. So um, one of the questions is, uh, since winning the Coleworth Medal, um, what standout opportunities or achievements have you been able to win or um, have an experience of or participate in? And um, in your experience, um, what single bit of advice, I think we've had lots of really sterling advice already, but what single piece of advice would you give to an ECR um, who's hoping to achieve a sort of uh, Colworth medal worthy career? So um, two two things there. Um, has anybody got anybody want to go first? So or what do you? Yes, Steve, go ahead. I, I'll I'll be brief here. I mean, I think in the end, uh, Coleworth Medal is particularly important because it's at the stage of the career that it comes, and to have an award when you're in your early to mid thirties can make all the difference. Um, other people's perception, but also your own perception of yourself and we've talked about failures and in the end you can talk yourself out of doing things you can talk yourself out your career is going nowhere but nobody succeeds in science i think without having some self-belief and being able to pick themselves up and so getting a Coleworth medal early on really helps you and awards like that 
Um, and for me, my only advice would be, you know, I, I didn't think about the Coldworth Medal when I was doing my science or, or any of the other awards for that matter. Um, and I'm sure that's the case with the other panelists. But it's but my only advice is, is science is a great career. You know, you're, you're discovering about the natural world and seeing things potentially that nobody else on earth is seeing. Just enjoy being a scientist and see where it takes you. And if you might make a big discovery and get an award, maybe you'll make a smaller discovery, but you're all adding to the body of science uh, and it's a, it's a noble career. So that would be my advice. Lovely, thank you. To have Robin? Yeah, I, I completely echo that. I mean, I think, you, you know, if you, if you are aspiring to get the Coleworth Medal, you're already making the wrong decision. You should not be doing this because you want to get a medal. You should be doing this because it's fun and it's interesting and it's what gets you out of bed in the morning. Um, uh, and that is in no way to belittle. I mean, I'm delighted I got it and I'm, I'm really honoured by it. Um, but, you know, that was not why I did any of the stuff that I did before then. Um, in terms of what the impact it's had, I mean, I was very lucky because I was in the 50th year, as, as Giles mentioned, so I had a, quite a big shindig actually around that. I met loads and loads of fantastic people at that uh, meeting, uh, including, in fact, Dario Alessi, with whom I then published a paper a bit later on. So that was a, that was a kind of good segue there. Um, but I think, I mean, th there's a sort of pro and a con there, because, you know, part of it is you get this massive visibility and therefore people consider you for other things, which is great. Um, but I do think that plays into the point that Giles raised earlier, that there is a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy here. And I do I do worry a little bit, like, you know, people get a, a, a Nature paper or a Colworth medal or something, and suddenly then they get a whole bunch of other things uh, just because they're kind of in the in the public uh, arena. Right? And that's the, that's the sort of downside of these kind of things. I think you have to be very cautious with that. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, do as Steve said, do science because you love it and because it's fun and, and worry about everything else later. Cool. I'm getting a very strong message through, Giles. Yeah, I guess if I was to give one one piece of advice um, to to postdocs and younger PIs is to try to only do what only you can do. Um, and what I mean by that is 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 you know, science is a competitive business, um, and you should really, if at all possible, do what your expertise not just technical, but intellectual, your background, your context, your collaborators, enables you to do uh, better than anyone else. Because um, it's quite easy, particularly when you, if you come from a big lab, to, to, and, and, and to start starting off as in your own independent career, to do, think about doing big lab type of science, which tends to be very expensive, um, and maybe the, quite broad in scope so really think about what you're uniquely placed to do um, and that you are uniquely infused to do um, and you'll um, you know you'll provide unique insight into into tackling whatever question you feel is the most important yeah very good point um, Andrew? I don't think I'm going to add very much new at this point, but um, I'm just going to reiterate the fact that what you need to do really is just follow your nose, follow the science, work hard, achieve your goals, and you'll get somewhere. I feel you know, through my career, I've never had a plan. I've just moved from one thing to another. You may say it's a bad thing, but I think I've done okay out of it. I could have been better. I could have gone to more exciting places. Maybe I'd have got on further. I'd have done, discovered more things. Um, so it's just, you know, it's too much obsession these days about trying to plan a career. It's quite simple in science. If you do your experiments, get papers, do well, you'll progress. Just keep, so, yeah. That's good to hear. To Charles' point, I, I really agree with that. It's, um, there's so many things that you can do now, and it's always been the case in science, but often it's more important you deciding not to do certain things, or it's about seeing the wood for the trees. And, and using your experience, your environment to, maybe you're not unique, but at least you're playing in an area where you've got a chance <laughs> of, of, of being number one. Thank you so much. I think we've come to the end of the sort of um, questions that we really wanted to um, ask you. And then uh, we have some time now for um, some questions from um, the people who are listening. And maybe there's a question, there's time for a question from me as well. Um, but the first one that we've got coming through is um, how did the process of being nominated for the Colworth Medal um, come about for you? 
Does anybody know? I mean, how do you remember who it was or how you were first contacted? I'm not sure you're supposed to know if you're nominated. Um, I mean, when, when I got it, I, I, I realised who nominated me, but I don't think I knew before I'd heard. Interesting. OK. Um, our processes have changed actually recently a little bit. And so I think that's possibly the same again. But in between, uh, people did know um, who nominated them. I'm, I'm desperate to ask a question of my own. You know, I'm just going to take chair's privilege and ask that. Um, if there was one thing you could change in the world of sort of biochemistry and you know a career in as a biochemist or a bioscientist, one small thing that you could change. I mean, we could all change everything, but what do you think would have had the most impact on your career or on the careers of people you see around you now? Oh, science, Andrew. Um, it would be consistent funding to have something to keep your lab going. I mean, that would be yeah. a small change I would make when there's constant having to renew all the time. So people in research institutes would have that, a bit even they have quinquennial reviews, but some sort of security, I think, is that. Yeah, um, I, th I totally agree with you. That would make such a huge difference for everybody that I see around. Um, any other suggestions? Um, Steve? Oh, sorry. I mean, I, I, my science, I've, I've found ways to translate it into the biotech and uh, that arena, but I'm a great believer in fundamental science. And, and, and I think uh, I, I'm concerned that more of the funding bodies are, are, are wanting mission oriented science and, uh, and uh, uh, outcome oriented science rather than fundamental discovery. But all the truly great science and breakthroughs come through fundamental science. And so I think that is a threat um, that hopefully won't come to pass. Yeah, the discovery science, the blue sky thinking. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Giles? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I was going to say something st similar to Steve, which is basically to have more, particularly when you're younger, is to have a greater capacity to fail. Um, I think when you're a young PI, um, you really can't afford to fail um, because you might have maybe one grant, and if you don't, if that doesn't deliver, then 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 that can be it can be difficult to get the next one. So so I think as 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 was said earlier, some guaranteed funding so one can aim for higher reward but higher risk projects. Um, is uh is really really important i think and i think p the, there should be more funding for based on people with good ideas rather than what people have done in their past um and then the final thing i think that the whole field should work should 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 become a cultural shift is is the um depositing and availability of every single piece of raw data attached to your manuscript. Too much work these days is, is hard to reproduce um, and, and hard to reanalyze. And I think greater data democratization um, is, is, will, will fuel discovery science, particularly with the advances in machine learning and AI. Um, I think more data-driven innovation, I think, would be transformative for, 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 for the next generation of, of PIs. Thanks. Yeah, there's so much data out there that we really need to corral it, don't we? Uh, Robin, do you do you have something to say? Yeah, I was going to say, um, as for maybe something controversial, I think we need to become less competitive. And I mean, uh, I can't remember who it was that said earlier that science is a competitive business, and that's entirely fair. But I, I worry that we've become so competitive. We measure, particularly new PIs, we measure everything, how many people PhD students, how much grant income, how many papers, how many conferences they've been to, uh, and it becomes a bit self-fulfilling that people are doing this because they need to get the metric and not because it's important. You know, I often say to people, if you can come up with a Nobel Prize winning idea with a you know pencil and a piece of paper and your grant income was 50p, you know, that is that is far better than, than a grant income of multiple millions. Um, uh, so so I, I do I do wish, you know, I could wave a magic wand and we all step away a bit from that and ask the question about 
what is the stuff you're working on or what is exciting about it rather than how much money did you bring in last year? Yeah, really good point as well. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, we're, we're running out of time um, and I've really, really enjoyed um, listening to your responses to our questions and the conversation. I, you know, I wish we had a lot more time to do this. Um, but um, so I, you know, so I think we have to finish uh, the webinar for this time. Um, that I have got some messages um, to say at the end of this, but yeah, absolutely delighted to meet all of you. And thank you so much for giving your time uh, to chat to us today. Um, so um, if anybody wants to continue uh, with this conversation um, offline or rather online, um, you can follow uh, Biochemsop and um, PP, well, Portland Press Publishing, PP Publishing on Twitter. Uh, so please go to those um, and uh, contribute and engage in the conversation. Um, you can find out more. So all of our Colworth winners were nominated for their awards. So do go to our awards program um, on our website and find out about our latest winners. Their new nominations opening um, in 2020, the 2025 round, they'll be opening in August this year. So think about all the people who um, helped you or who have done um, really good things. Uh, there are different types of awards for all sorts of different people at different stages um, in the biosciences, so do have a look. Uh, you can find out more information about our webinar series, propose your own webinar and watch previous recordings um, at our website uh, on the events and training uh, page. Um, and look at our, do look at our website for all the future webinars. Um, but if you've missed any of them, they're all recorded. So you can look at them or you can look at your favourite ones again um, and look at our website or YouTube um, channel. Um, and this one will be available to watch within the next couple of weeks. Um, so our next webinar is on the 22nd of June at 11 a.m. Uh, British summer time, and it is summer, um, how to apply for Biochemical Society grants. So um, in this session, members of the grants committee will be available to discuss what makes a successful grant application, as well as exploring what the committee look for during the review process. Um, and there'll be a chance to ask questions to the committee and take away useful tips. Um, Finally, I'd like to highlight that it's more important than ever to stay connected and um, engage with your fellow molecular bioscientists. It's an exciting time to join the Biochemical Society's community of researchers and specialists. Um, we have lots of benefits, including discounted registration fees for society courses and meetings, exclusive access to a wide range of grants and bursaries, personal online access to two of their journals, and more. And just personally for me, uh, the society has been so valuable in finding a community like this of like-minded scientists outside my own university. Uh, we may not necessarily collaborate with each other or even work in the same area of bioscience, but we can share and learn so much more from each other. And we can do that through the Biochemical Society while working to improve and enrich the lives and careers of our fellow scientists. And with that, I'd like to say thanks to everybody. Thanks particularly to our panelists again. Um, and uh, goodbye till the next one. Thank you so much. Hope you meet in real life at some point. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Yes,